take a look at this vector identity. Here we have the curl of u. Then we're taking the cross part of that with the del operator. So this would be the curl of the curl of u. And we're supposed to prove that it equals this. So we're not going to explain the steps in a lot of detail now because we're really repeating what we've done in the uh, previous videos. But let's call this vector A, its cross product. So we have del cross A using the permutation symbol. It would be epsilon. And for del, we'd have a partial operator sign. Some component of vector A times a unit vector. And we will arbitrarily call this unit vector I. Then this can be J. This K, so you have epsilon J K I. And from our previous videos, you know we like to work with our expression in a component form. And so this is EI, then the ith component of this is just this without the EI. And again, we've gone over that many times now in the previous videos. Now here we have a kth component of vector A, but A itself is a cross product. So A we could write like this. Again, epsilon, partial with some index, some component of vector U, and a unit vector. We want a kth component of vector A, so this will be K, and we can have labels or indexes L and M here. So we have L, M, K. And then again from the previous videos, we know that the kth component of this vector, A sub K, that's this without this. So where we stand right now is we have an expression for the ith component of this. Del cross A, A is this, the ith component equals epsilon JKI partial J times AK, but AK is this. So we have epsilon L M K partial of L U sub m. Now the purpose of writing our expression in component form, as you saw in the previous videos, on this side we typically had then was a bunch of scalars. And the order in which we multiply and add the scalars together was irrelevant, so we could shift the scalars around. Now here we have a scalar, but these two obviously are not scalars, these are partial derivatives. But the order in which you take partial derivatives, that doesn't matter. If, for example, we take the partial with respect to L, then take the partial with respect to J, or if we take the partial with respect to J, then with respect to L, it gives us the same answer either way. So you can take this and move it over to here. So we would have partial. partial U M J L. Now we're multiplying two permutation symbols together. We see they share a common index. Here's a K and here's a K. And in order to now invoke some version of our epsilon delta identity, the way we have it constructed, they, the common index, the shared index, has to be the first index, as we did here and here. So 
we look at this, the k we can get over to here just by moving it once, twice. That's an even permutation. It won't change the sign of anything. And we have LM, LM, we preserve that order. So that's all set. Now here, we want k to be in the first position. So we could have epsilon k j i. That gives us a minus sign here. But we could move the i over to here. Now we permuted it twice. That's an even number. Now there is no negative sign. And then for this epsilon, there's only this associated with it. Here we had LM, LM. We want to preserve that order. Here at this epsilon, there's only one index associated with it. So we can write, instead of JKI, KIJ. Now we're all set to use our identity. So we know this will equal, we have a pair of deltas minus a pair of deltas. Then we have partial j, partial l, u sub m. Now, for these indexes, we follow the pattern of what we've been doing ever since, I think, video number nine. It is inner, inner, so we have IL, then outer, outer, that's J, M, then it is minus inner, outer, I am, and then outer inner, that is J L. So this is equivalent to this. Now I want to consider what effect does this pair of Kronecker deltas have on this expression and what effect does this pair of Kronecker deltas have on this expression? So we look here. This is zero unless i equals l. But there is no i over here. So we, can, we consider the equivalent statement. This is zero unless l equals i. So this is going to change to an i. Then, here we can say, this is 0 unless j equals m, in which case that would change to an m. Or, we could use the equivalent statement, it's 0 unless m equals j, in which case that change, that's the same, and that changes to a j. Either way, it gives us, in the end, the same answer. We will go that route. So. What we have right now is this is equal to partial of j, partial of i, and then we have u sub j. Then we'll have minus. Now we consider the effect of this pair of Kronecker deltas. This is 0 unless i equals m. There's no i over here. So take the equivalent statement. m has to be equal to i. So this is going to change to an i. Then here, this is 0 unless j changes to an l. That would change. That'd be an l. Or it's 0 unless L equals J. We can do it either way. We'll do it this path. So this is going to become a J. 
Either way, it would give us the same answer in the end. So here we have partial with respect to j, partial with respect to j. That's partial squared j u of i. Now here, we can shift these around if we want to. Does it matter in which order we perform the partial differentiation? So we have it like this. And remember, I think from video 15, where we determined that the divergence of a vector in component form is this. And that's what this is. So we can rewrite this. This equals partial i, then here we will have del dot u. Then we have minus partial j squared. Now, remember, I think it was from video 14, where we wrote the del operator like this with this partial differentiation symbol where this denotes this. Now if we have del dot del, that'd be this dot this. This of course is just one, so del dot del is just this squared, taking the partial derivative twice, and del dot del is usually designated like this, del squared. So here we have del squared. Ui. And what does that equal? That is the ith component of this. So we have del cross del cross u ith component. Okay, well let's multiply both sides of the equation by the unit vector ei. This right here, then, is just the entire vector, del cross del cross u. This is how we've been writing vectors ever since the first video. And this equals del partial I, E, I, but that is the del operator. These are dummy indexes, of course. This could be Z, Z, L, L, whatever. Here in this case happens to be I, I, but that gives the del operator. Then we have del dot the vector U. Then we have minus del squared, and that's the vector u. So there is our identity. Now here, for the divergence, this is a dot product, so that means this is a scalar. So we have del operating on a scalar, so this gives us a gradient vector. And of course, all this means is that we're taking uh, partial derivatives twice, second order partial derivatives, del squared simply means partial squared with respect to x1 plus partial squared 
with respect to x2 plus partial squared with respect to x3. So here all we're doing is taking the second derivatives of the different components of vector u. Anyway, this right here is the identity that we wanted to prove. And again, we did that along the way using the epsilon delta identity. Okay, I think this is video 16 in our series, uh, the uh, super powerful vector identity technique. The uh, playlist for this series and all of the videos is at the website digital-university.org.